Hello, welcome to the Donahue Group. We're glad you could join us for a, an interesting conversation about uh, issues uh, relating to the state of Wisconsin, maybe a little bit beyond. We'll see what time allows. Joining me today, Ken Risto, social, social, excuse me, social studies teacher from the Sheboygan Area School District. Tom Paneski, math professor, associate dean at UW Sheboygan. Cal Potter, state senator, political maven, just the guy that you go to when you want to know what's really going on. I'm Mary Lynn Donahue. I'm a lawyer at O'Neill Cannon here in Sheboygan, and uh, we're ready to go talking about, we just got all steamed up about <laughs> the beer tax <laughs> as we were sitting here. We finished up our last show talking a little bit about the um, series of articles that the Sheboygan Press had done on alcohol and its role in Wisconsin life. And uh, interest in, Cal, you had made the, the response just in private that the Tavern League is somewhat akin to the NRA in terms of political clout and mm -hmm. um, uh, willingness to kind of go to the mat for its, for its, uh, its uh, uh, I might have said agenda. NBA, but, uh, if you want to say NRA, <laughs> that's okay. Very cute. Well, that's, Very that's, cute. Yeah. <laughs> or WEAC in the state of Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they drink less, I think. <laughs> or WMC, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Um, yeah, there are, there are certain groups that I think, if you were to say what are the top five groups uh, that exhibit uh, strong political power, I think. Uh, one of those groups is the Tavern League in the state of Wisconsin. They have a very strong membership. I think it's one of the yeah. most numerous, uh, numerous uh, membership roster in the country. And uh, they have restaurant people and who have liquor licenses and bar bars. And so those folks uh, have their own lobbyists, usually multiple lobbyists. And they're there to make sure that things like an increase in the beer tax or a liquor tax are, um, are not passed. And they... They're there at every time a drunk driving bill is up as well. And I think over the years, uh, they have focused in on the multiple offender. And I think that's one of the reasons why, um, even in Wisconsin, it's a rather light sentence for the first offense, drunk driving, compared to other states. Uh, I think it is maybe the most lenient of any state in the union. Uh, and you can say that the alcohol consumption and the popularity thereof has uh, created a situation of tolerance that everybody's sort of do one mistake. And, uh, but even I think we've been remiss in not being strong enough in our laws on multiple offenders as we've seen in the last year or so. There have been a number of innocent people killed by people who have been on the road for multiple convictions. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, uh, as we've been talking about this, we learned that the beer tax in Wisconsin has not been changed since 1969. Which is pretty remarkable. 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> Almost 40 and it's years. a buck, a barrel. Dollar barrel. And it comes out, what, a half a cent a, on a bottle, on a, bottle, a glass of beer? Mm -hmm. Half a cent penny. And it's, it's my sense that um, any proposal to up that is, I don't know if I would say political suicide, but it is certainly. Um, it's not, it's not entertained an, by any party in the, it, in the state legislature. It, right, and uh, um, I do know that uh, Therese Berceau, who is a representative, is, is giving some thought to, to advancing the cause of, of raising that tax. And maybe as our finances continue to deteriorate and we continue to look for, goodness knows we tax cigarettes um, a substantial amount, as we should. Goodness knows we tax gasoline a substantial amount, and, and, that, and that has certainly has some controversial, but I think overall sound public policy. Um, but beer, goodness, I mean, we could increase it to two cents a glass <laughs> and probably wouldn't make a, a whole lot of difference uh, in terms of consumption patterns and yet you know, raise some needed revenue. I wonder if, if there'll be any if there'll be any move afoot uh, anytime soon? Do you think it's... I, I, I don't see it, but uh, I think maybe w w success might come if you tied it to something of, of a worthy nature. I've often wondered if you couldn't, if we had a progressive uh, movement in the state to provide health insurance for people or health care for people and put, you know, another 20 cents in a pack of cigarettes and 
about two bucks on a barrel of beer and 25 cents on a, a flask of gin or something like that. You could nickel and dime your way into a goodly sum of money to provide people with decent health care coverage and you could do it very justifiably because smoking and drinking do have uh, repercussions in people's health. And I, I, I think you know, that way it might uh, even be some, some benefit to tavern owners who don't have health insurance or have a tough time getting it. So, you know, everybody could buy into this in some way, both the drinker and the seller, and uh, have, do something for society. It would be great if we had some legislators listening to this conversation on the Donahue Group, because I think that is an interesting uh, point. And of course, nationwide, uh, alcoholism or alcohol is just behind cigarettes in terms of number mm -hmm. of people it kills each year. Yeah. And um, the numbers uh, for both are phenomenal. And uh, Not only health, but driving. Well, right. Anywhere 40 to 50 percent of fatalities, aren't they involved in alcohol in some way? Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Well, we'll see if, um, if there's any courage shown in the, uh, in the legislature and we won't hold our breaths, but uh, in any event, it sounds like an idea whose time should come if it has not. <laughs> well, I, I, I've gone through suggestions like this while I was in the legislature, and uh, not only the Tavern League uh, making the pitch that the bottle of beer is a, the working man's friend at the end of the day, and you don't want to tax them too much because it's one of the simple pleasures of life uh, to the beer industry that at one time was a major part of the state. I mean, when Blatz and Schlitz and Pabst and Miller and all were the Bud dominant, <laughs> and you know, were dominant in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. it was sort of a protection of our own. These are people that you don't want to tax. You want to encourage them. You love them. They pay taxes. They provide jobs. Then it became when they started leaving and were being gobbled up by other. Uh, brands. Then all of a sudden you had the sort of the reverse. Well, the Stephen Point Brewery or the Line and Kugels or the whoever's left is small. You don't want to be punitive. You want to have them grow. So the brewing industry took on a different uh, point of view as to for sort of protection. So between the Tavern League and the brewing industry and various facets in this state, uh, those ideas were always had somebody giving some impassioned argument why we ought not to have a beer tax of any substance in the state. But one of the, I, just, I just think that, you know, if the math was right in the article we were looking at before, the tape started running, it's a half, the proposal goes from $2, the current $2, to 10 Okay, so that means that on an average bottle of beer, the tax is going to go from a half a cent to two and a half cents. Is, do we really believe that the person sitting down having a couple of beers while watching the Brewer game is really going to be deterred by that Two extra five cents. or seven <laughs> I cents? Know, I know. When people have been, you know, it, it's just a, it's, the Tavern League is just making a, really a kind of a bogus argument, it yeah. seems to me. Um, well, but. switching to energy, and which we could all use a little of here in August. Um, the burning alcohol type. <laughs> ethanol. We're going to talk about ethanol. Right? The alcohol uh, to ethanol. Nice segue. I really think that energy is going to be the sum and substance of a whole lot of um, campaigns this fall in particular. And uh, what I was looking at, um, rem I think remarkably enough, but maybe, maybe not. I'm interested in your perspective. Governor Doyle um, is changing his mind on the 1983 moratorium that was enacted statewide on the construction of new nuclear power plants and saying that that is something that we should take a look at. Um, the sheer cost of nuclear power, constructing nuclear power plants, is so stunningly large that I don't know as how that nuclear power plants are really an alternative. But something that we ought to be taking a look at, is this something that the governor's principally, you know, on a principled basis looking at, or politics? What are your thoughts? I think four dollars a gas a gallon of gasoline changes a lot of people's yeah, right. perspectives. I think the general public uh, has gone from opposed to offshore drilling to be supportive of it, which is quite a change within a few months. So I wouldn't doubt that there are many politicians who are saying four dollars a gallon for gasoline, which translates into heating oil at four some dollars a gallon and propane at two dollars something a gallon. And so I think there are people who are saying. Uh, maybe there's the economics of, of nuclear power aren't as bad as they used to be when mm -hmm. gasoline was a dollar mm -hmm. or two dollars a gallon. 
-hmm. And doesn't mm -hmm. France's mm -hmm. energy structure, what, 70% nuclear power? And they seem to be doing all, you know. But how are you going to fight the environmental groups? I mean, uh, well, and I think they'll even be out marching and not in my backyard and et cetera, et cetera, Well, that, that is one of the real issues down the line is, you know, in the short run, if you really want to, on the one hand, find alternative energy resources that aren't fossil-based and get greenhouse emissions, that's why France and a lot of European countries can talk a little easier about this topic than the United States can, is because of the reliance on nuclear energy. Germany is in not much different shape than France. In the short run, their renewables aren't in a position yet to, to, to fill in that gap or provide an alternative, and you're almost by default led down this road. But then what do you do with the waste? The Congress, how many years now has Congress been <laughs> kicking around where to go with waste? And the states are making it, like Nevada and New Mexico and some other states and Native American peoples on those lands oftentimes are saying, you know, we don't want to take other states' waste. Yep. So what do you do with the waste, and what do you do with the cost of mothballing these things? I think we're getting pretty close to mothballing or having to mothball the Kiwani plant, I believe, in the next 10, 15 years. You're going to have to disassemble that, that nuclear power plant and figure out what to do with oh, all nice. of those pieces of, of metal. And I just, I just don't know what, what, how we're going to approach that, that problem. And in the new aspect is, of course, after 9-11, uh, mm -hmm. what if security is breached and somebody does has a substantial explosive device and all of a sudden uh, something in an urban area is exploded and you do have a leak? I mean, we're in the United States where we don't tolerate that type of uh, uh, risk on people. I, mm -hmm. Russia did it with Chernobyl, but they didn't much. We communist. did it with Three Mile Island. <laughs> well, we were more open about it we than were. Russia was, and, and it was not as, as, as severe. True. I that's mean, true. Uh, Russia never really did own up to what it did to its own citizens mm -hmm. at Chernobyl. And so sometimes you wonder uh, can these, they say, uh, they by they, the proponents, that these sites are bomb secure and so on. But in this day of sophisticated mm -hmm. terrorism, I, I'm not so sure. But you know, there's a, there are other aspects, I think, that we need to think about. You know, talking about Germany, Germany has um, gone on a massive solar kick. Right. And they were going to have, I believe, by uh, 2020, 25% right. I think of their um, <clears throat> energy produced by solar. Mm -hmm. They're already near that already. Now they're looking to maybe they can go to 40. So oh, is that here, right? Here's a country that's not that sunny. But they have made a concerted effort yeah. to uh, go to an alternative, you know, sustainable type of energy, and they're, they're doing it. We have not. I mean, we have had presidents like Jimmy Carter who said this day was coming that we're in today, and they laughed at him. Who's this crazy guy from, from Georgia? What's he talking about? And, you know, he was sort of belittled. Well, had we done what he told us to do mm -hmm. 30 years ago, you know, we'd probably even be better shaped than we are. Yeah. I, um... Note that uh, you may or may not remember that uh, Oak Creek near Milwaukee is the site for these new huge coal-fired energy generation plants uh, that I think We Energies, silly me, I'm not 100% yep. sure, yes. we but it is we, we Energies is, is put into place. And uh, Clean Wisconsin and the Sierra Club got them to agree to a settlement of a lawsuit for various uh, administrative infractions. Uh, of $105 million over a 25-year period of time to be invested in um, safekeeping of Lake Michigan and other environmental issues. So I thought, I thought that was interesting because I do think coal plants are still so much more economical to build mm -hmm. than uh, nuclear power plants. Very much so. um, the, the last article that I read talked about just the sheer impossibility of doing much with nuclear because it's so expensive to build the plants. I mean, we're talking 15, 20 billion dollars to build a nuclear power plant now, as well as all the, the waste disposal issues which are intractable and impossible to solve. So even though the governor may be changing his mind on the moratorium, I'm not sure that that makes really a, a bit of difference. But I thought this $105 million settlement, which over 25 years is not much money, quite frankly, 
um, but it's better than a you know sharp stick in the eye, mm -hmm. and uh, was not a way a, a bad way of, of going about the settlement. On the on the building of nuclear power plants, what's the hardware cost and the time? There's a lot of litigation costs that I think mm -hmm. always come into play. Oh and sure, the permitting process is extremely time consuming. Time consuming and lengthy, so that mm -hmm. puts you know you got to this got a, this environmental impact statement, that envi and then you think you're all done, and then you get sued, and then. And you start the building in one year, and ten years later, you're still fighting legal battles. So, is that how much of the cost is just true building cost, and how much is litigation and everything else? Building permitting? a nuclear power plant is a little more complex than building a coal plant, and so the building costs themselves, I think, are substantially greater. I, but I, you're right; the permitting process. I was involved in the permitting process for the Peaker power plant that went in uh, in the town of Sheboygan Falls. Uh, Alliant uses it just in peak times to generate extra electricity which goes out on the power grid and I mean if you're going out on Highway 23 actually you can't even see it that much and I mean it's it's not a you know non-degraded piece of property but there it is. Um, Coal burning? Uh, mm -hmm. okay. Yes. No it's gas. No I'm sorry it's natural gas I'm natural sorry. Natural gas. Okay. And um, overall the permitting process for that relatively simple relatively small natural gas, non-polluting usually, um, um, uh, factory or, or plant was astonishing um, because not only were, were there the state clearances, there was the uh, county clearance and then of course the town of Sheboygan Falls had some very serious considerations about what this meant to the folks living in their town, um, you know, just a upkeep costs. I mean, there were just a wide variety of things that didn't add a lot of jobs, you know, so there wasn't any positive economic influence. But this is a tiny project in comparison to a nuclear power plant, which has the possibility of wiping away. I mean, if the Peaker power plant explodes, not that many people are going to get killed. <laughs> you know, if Kiwani goes up or, or Point Beach, I mean, we don't even think about that anymore, because, but Kiwani's had significant issues <coughs> with, with safety in recent years, and I think in part just because it's getting old. So, I, I mean, I do think that it's a combination of things. I mean, if you're in government, you certainly want to make sure that if you're allowing the construction of such a plant, that you can be reasonably assured you're not going to be blowing, you know, half the state or the whole state or a portion of the country up in in one fell swoop or contaminating an outer circle for years and years. And where are you going to find the sites? You need water for cooling. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Lake Michigan has been the site. Look at the hassle with trying to site the Haven plant before, obviously, it was sold to the Kohler Company for their golfing operation. But before that, it was not in my backyard. And that was Huge. many years ago. I mean, yeah. today, try to figure out with the suburban sprawl we have today, where you're going to locate a, a nuclear plant anywhere near the site where the power is needed. So nigh and impossible, I think. I mean, the backyard's gotten a whole lot bigger. Sure, sure it is. And, and, and so I, I think there are... Nuclear. I mean, we were just talking, you know, people don't want, you know, they don't want to have these large wind turbines anywhere near uh, where the wind is. Mm -hmm. You know, whether that be talking yeah. about, you know, in, out in Massachusetts, uh, out in the bay, you know, near Martha's Vineyard, uh, where, yeah, right. <laughs> where you've got Teddy Kennedy's properties in Hyannisport and, and those kinds of places where that's where you'd want to site them, even when they want to site them two or three miles out. Uh, they don't want to, you know, want to wreck that view, and understandably so. And I know people in Fond du Lac County are unhappy about what's, about the turbines out there. And I know in California they're having a fight about location of turbines because, as they put it, the, where the wind is, where the where the birds are, and this ends up being a cousinier for for you know all sorts of wildlife. Mm -hmm. And so you've got some really hard uh, issues uh, that people are going to we're going to have yeah. to if we want energy um, on the demand side or on the supply side, yeah. rather, boy, it's going to be some tough choices. Twenty years ago, we should have a national energy uh, yep. initiative like yeah. we did, putting the man on the moon, and focus in on photovoltaic cells, sure. cheap production of them, so people can put them on their houses. Um, we should have looked at uh, fuel cells. All your spacecraft are 
most of them are, well, they're solar plus the fuel cell. And that's what this whole electric car thing is. It's a, literally a fuel cell that uh, t takes water and can get, takes the hydrogen out of it, and it's clean. Uh, if we could get every household to have their own fuel cell, you'd have a self-contained energy unit right in the house. So the technology needs to be perfected, and we have really not had a national energy policy that focuses on that. We've been drunk with oil for these years and the political power of the oil industry, and it's been continued even to this day through the Cheneys and the Bushes. I mean, they have not been out there stellar leading the charge for alternatives. And, you know, it's, it's 20 years, 30 years overdue. Yeah, there's the solar the solar cell electri generated electricity is getting real close in cost to some of the yes. other ones now, yeah. and the the we the we are in a couple of weeks back they were talking about uh, the president of we or I think it was the president of We Electrics was talking about they're trying to build a new plant now in mm -hmm. uh, in near Milwaukee mm -hmm. and she made some passing reference that if that plant is built and it's supposed to be they're saying it's dual purpose it could burn other types of fuels besides coal. They had actually shut down the Sheboygan plant here because that is one of the dirtiest ones in the, in the in their array of of coal burning plants. Oh, is that right? Well, that's interesting. It is one of the older ones, uh -huh. and uh, I'm all for that. Yeah, it is an eyesore, isn't it? Well, not only an eyesore, <laughs> but it, it is. It really does add to the uh, to the amount of particulate matter that's in, the, in, in Sheboygan. As hard as high as those stacks are. Yeah. Um, you just see those plumes stretching out mm -hmm. across the across mm -hmm. the sky, and uh, so it's interesting. Well, it is becoming uh, energy is becoming an issue in the Kagan Guard race. We had talked about that, I think, even last time that Steve Kagan has had, a, I thought, an upset victory over John Guard. I mean, I, I was surprised uh, that he won, and now he has a record that he is trying to defend, which of course is always a little bit more a little bit more troubling and um or not troubling but more of a challenge and uh yeah, well, what what record they haven't done anything <laughs> they're they've got a long history of voting yeah, yeah they Excuse really me. do oh, they really do oh okay you see what happens tom is that when there are different uh, parties in 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 uh, power not everything gets passed. It's it's not a monarchy. Uh, you know, oh, there was actually oh. debate and nothing gets yeah. passed. Well, anyway, <laughs> never mind. In some respects, that's in the not Senate, so bad. You need Sixty now yeah. for everything. Right. Yeah, you really do. You the filibuster. Well, you're the filibuster even a majority be, considering the filibuster used to be Lieberman years. and, and you, the Vermont senators and independents. So you really don't have a very functional majority at all in right. the Senate. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the filibuster used to be rather used extraordinarily. Mm -hmm. Now it's used as a procedural matter as almost all the time. Uh, it's nothing more than a threat. Yeah. You schedule this, we're going to filibuster, so things aren't scheduled even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's complex. And, uh, but uh, anyway, in any I event... I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, anyway. no. I, and, but I think that is, you know, that is part of the, the national background that, that Kagan has played in. And um, um, so he and Garter are duking it out in terms of, um, uh, of energy policy. Obviously, McCain and Obama are are heavily involved in energy policy kinds of issues. So, I mean, I think it is a time at this point to maybe have a sensible national debate and state debate and even local debate as we do in Sheboygan with our sustainability committee through the city council about, you know, just, you know, what we're doing. So I don't know how charged up the electorate gets about it. I don't know either. You know, when we look at the amount of, 30-second ads that are being felt by people in this part of the state. It's not only the Kagan guard race, but it's the McCain-Obama race. We're one of the top receivers of political mm -hmm. uh, ads, and those what ads are, <laughs> and those ads are just inane. Yeah. 30-second ads. So how much people can tolerate? I don't know. Yeah. I turn them off. I. I got that remote in my hand and they're <laughs> off. I can't stand it. Well, people in Green Bay are going to be seeing huge yeah. numbers of oh, ads yeah. because it's really one of the seats that the Republicans have a Some reasonably good shot of winning. Getting yeah. Back, yeah. yeah, across the country. Um, and so and I'm sure the Democrats are going to defend that seat to the hills. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be large amounts of national money pouring into Green Bay. Yeah. Not the 
put up another channels. television station. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're getting stock. I don't know how many of those are publicly owned, but they're going to be. Yeah, they're going to be seeing. A Too bad Channel Eight money. couldn't get a little bit of you know. Yeah, that's right. But, you know, yeah. we could call it you know public financing dollars, and we could. But I don't think like even put the clock back on the wall. <laughs> and, I don't think there's going to be much of an edifying debate about um, energy policy I don't think so in the midst of this election. I no. You're right. I mean, it's thirty. It's, it's offshore drilling as if it could happen tomorrow. Right. Not this couple ten years down the future. Right. There's, no, I, I don't think it's going to be of any of any substance. Well, I, I mean, you know, look at you know, you can do talk about you know things that really matter right now. You know, so Obama gets skewered for mentioning inflating your tires, which is really is kind of silly when you. But but in fact, is really serious business. If you're really interested about increasing uh, your fuel efficiency and you want to do something right now, as opposed to drilling someplace and maybe yeah. getting some oil five, six, seven, eight, ten years from now. Here's what you uh, do. That'd be actually actually fairly good. Or changing light bulbs, you know, and none of that stuff is exciting. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear it. And, and how many? And then you, and you just ask you set yourself for being laughed. How at. many people actually check their tires for inflation? And how many people get oil changes? Quote, <laughs> they just you know people drive. Yeah, I go into. I just you know you people just drive cars into the ground and yeah. just go on. I mean, yeah. so how, what percentage of people would actually look at their tires? Uh, and how many politicians will? be very direct with their constituents and say, what the heck do you need a V8 engine for in that car? Well, exactly. yeah. One of my favorite articles of all time was in Mother Jones some time ago about ultra milers. And the, their big home is in Madison, Wisconsin, and these are the folks who get between 100 and 120 miles per gallon from, like, my 2001 Ford Focus. But he, talk about lifestyle changes. First of all, you hardly ever use your brakes, so you don't travel very fast. <laughs> <laughs> and so make all right turns. <laughs> yeah, and they um, they never uh, roll down a window because that will uh, increase uh, wind resistance. And of course, you don't use your air conditioning. And so um, so they have. And these it was a great article. And these guys are focused on yeah. on their mileage and their even contests and I think the greatest I think the winner in this particular contest was 132 miles per gallon and this is on a regular car you know not a big car but you know like a, a you Ford want Focus to be them. <laughs> well that's <laughs> on it Taylor Drive. on oh, Taylor yeah. uh, we <laughs> although you can also I thought uh, just in terms of, of uh, real gas savings, being an ultra miler, so I try to take my foot off the gas pedal. I've always been good about braking, but I'm trying to be extra good now and see how many people I get really irritated with me. Good news, bad news, we're almost out of time. Um, Governor Doyle, um, uh, the good news is he has shrunk the size of government by 2,000 state jobs all in the areas where I need to do business, so it's really a hassle. Uh, bad news, he promised 10,000 uh, jobs. Um, what do you think, good news or bad news? Good beginning, I guess. Well, I think you want to do it by attrition, and I'm not so sure. sure with economic conditions how many people are taking early retirement considering the fact that they may have to work till they're 80 to pay for the things as the, uh, that are getting more expensive. So I think probably it was over-optimistic uh, to say that by attrition and reorganization, you could call out 10,000 jobs out of the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I th at least 2,000 are gone. Republicans have to be happy about that. And now well, it's time. It's all, maybe it's all our university our professors that <laughs> he cut out. I and now we have exactly. to stop. Yeah. And now we have to stop. Jobs. So on that happy note, <laughs> goodbye, everyone. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>